It's great to be here in Zagreb. Um, last time I was here, I think it was 15 years ago, I was interrailing, staying in a hostel. Um, so very different. Uh, but this is great. Ivan and the team have done a great job organizing this conference. This is very hard to do. Um, so um, lucky to be here. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you about discovering FIRE. Um, and FIRE is a data model. It's a data schema. Um, it's kind of how we view the world at Suede. Um, and another way to look at this is why your data quality problems are not down to your user, right? It's not their fault, so you shouldn't blame them. Um, so can I get a show of hands? Who here is a application builder versus an application user? So application users, everyone? Application builders? Yes, OK. Who didn't raise their hand and why? There were only two choices. Um, so what I did there was I classified everyone here into two groups, right? The world is not black and white. There's a lot more color to that. So we're going to talk about that now. Um, so for those of us that don't, for those of you that don't know us, um, we are a reg tech company. And we were founded in 2014 to largely deal with um, regulatory problems in banks, right? So I used to work in banking. My co-founder used to work in banking. And um, we had a belief at the time there were a lot of fintech startups, and they were all competing with banks, trying to take their market share, trying to take their customers. Um, and we came with the belief that um, banks were still going to be around in 10 years, 20 years um, as takers of risk. You know, sorry, peer to peer, sorry, blockchain. Um, and we need to help these organizations deal with regulation to become better regulated, more efficient, more transparent, um, to lower their costs so they can serve the communities better. Um, so, we believe regulation is good, and regulators are trying to make the world a better place, um, but the implementation has its challenges, right? And so, uh, I'm a physicist, and this is kind of how I view the world. Everything's an equation. Um, on the left-hand side, you have the regulatory function, right? This is some big function or functions that take in variables, take in inputs, and they produce some kind of output, right? And so this. Regulatory function is defined by rules, regulations, laws, um, legislations, guidance, uh, Q&A papers, things like that. Um, and on the right-hand side, you have the output, right? This is the, um, the CSV file, the XML file, the, uh, you know, the reports, the analytics, the dashboards, all that stuff the regulator looks at in order to evaluate the system and determine what's going on, right? To prevent a crisis, right? This is the whole objective. And the idea is that if they specify the rules and regulations clear enough, and they write thousands of pages of legislation, that the outputs will be comparable and standardized. They can measure and compare and justify and, um, and monitor the system right, and tweak it as required. The problem is no one ever talks about the data, the inputs that go into these calculations, these huge applications that produce these outputs. Um, but there is data, right? It's just the problem is that everyone uses a different data set, a different set of definitions. Um, and so when I say discovering fire, it's very much around discovering what this data is, right? Discovering what this data should be. Because every organization we went to, every bank, every financial institution um, that we spoke to gave us different data sets. And we said, how can you be doing the same thing to produce the same output with different data, right? Um, and so the financial regulation data format is very much designed to provide quality control and governance for financial institutions. Um, this is an open source project. It's on GitHub under the Apache license. It was started in 2016 with funding from the European Commission. They were super supportive because they write the laws. Um, the Open Data Institute in London was also very uh, helpful in how to design a standard, how to provide um, you know, examples and, and use cases for people. Um, and really, what you want to do is to create a standardized data model that sort of underpins all financial regulation. Um, and this you can, right? Because regulation is actually defined, right? Lawyers are quite specific. They write definitions. They put things in quotes. They say this means that. They capitalize terms. They're actually very logical. The problem is it's not technical in the technology sense. Uh, it's all in words, right? So the goal of this project is to extract those definitions, to extract that meaning and put it into a usable form by developers. Um, and so what this will do, uh, or what it's doing now, is it produces comparability 
um, for those outputs for regulators, right? And banks themselves, right? So if you're a bank and you want to metric yourself against another bank, now you can, right, with this kind of data format. Um, and the third sort of consequence of, this, uh, of having this sort of solution is the fact that you now get seamless integration on this data format. So if you're a new fintech and you want to do you know, credit scoring and you want to get some loans from a bank, then you can say, are you using this format? This format's online. I understand this format. I have an ETL. Um, if you can send me that format, we can get started right away. Right? So it removes that whole consultation of you know, what does your data look like? What format is it in? What are your definitions? Shall we hire KPMG to come and do an ETL here? All those things, right? Um, you can get started very quickly. Um, so I'm going to go back. These are out of order. Um, so now we know what we want to do. We want to create this harmonized data model. Um, but people always say, garbage in, garbage out. Right? So even if you have a great model, then you know, we have bad data. Right? Everyone you go to visit says, oh, we have bad data. Even if your software is great, you know, your AI is great, our data is terrible. We can't work with you. Right? So from the point of view of someone who develops software, that's a terrible excuse. Right? That is just a cop-out answer. And really what you're saying to me, if you say, you know, garbage in, garbage out, it means that as an application developer, you're OK with garbage. You're willing to accept garbage into your application. Right? And as someone who spends hours and hours and hours coding and building tools, building software, you know, this is your baby. You don't want garbage coming in, right? Um, so to me, that's not acceptable. I won't accept any garbage into my software. And next, if you're saying garbage in, garbage out, it's kind of like saying, that's not my problem, right? Garbage, you're going to give me garbage, and you know, I'll deal with it, I'll handle it, I'll reject it, but that's not my problem. Right? And again, that's a cop-out answer, an excuse to avoid dealing with the problem. Um, and if you're accepting garbage, then logically, you don't care about the output either. Right? So garbage in, garbage out. You don't care if your software produces horrible results, because right? it's not your fault. Right? So these are all terrible excuses. Um, and I wouldn't hire someone who says garbage in, garbage out. Um, so we're going to talk about today how we could leverage the data model itself um, and how we're doing this with Fire to actually prevent garbage into your application. Um, but first, let's uh, discuss what is bad data. Right? So I want to ask a few questions to the audience, um, if they can describe what bad data is like. So those of you that are, I guess, users or builders, um, is there a microphone somewhere? We can use this one. Yeah. Um, anybody want to tell me or take a stab at what bad data, what characteristics does it have? What do you say? Bad data is just useless data. Useless. That's not a good description. That doesn't tell me anything about the data. How, what does useless data look like? No? Nobody? We all deal with data on a daily basis. Nobody has any ideas what bad data looks like. No? In the back? I suppose bad data is incorrect data. Yeah, bad data is incorrect. That's true. Or it's missing. Or old. Or old, <laughs> yeah. Anyone else? Here? Maybe you can just shout. <laughs> Yes, incoherent, data that comes in multiple formats um, when it should be the same. That's a great answer. Here in the front? No? OK, all right, well, in the interest of time, I'll move forward. Uh, so in that vein, bad data looks like this. So if you go to any large organization and they say they have bad data and you say, let me take a look at it, you'll see data that looks like this. You'll have data with no definitions, columns, that have some name, but no one knows what it means, right? Or there'll be some just random numbers or some strange code, right? No validation. So this comes to your point about different formats for the same data, right? No one is validating what's coming in. Missing values, wrong values, right? This is data which should be there but isn't, or is there but doesn't look correct, right? 
Um, there's two that weren't mentioned, which are flags. So flags are essentially what I did at the beginning, classifying things into binary uh, black and white categories. Uh, the world is not black and white. And even if it is black and white today, it might change in the future, right? So if you think about that little gender drop down you get in forms, it used to just say male and female. Now you're getting three, maybe four options, right? So your data model has to be resilient to the future, resilient to change. Um, so flags are bad. And derived values is something that we'll talk more about. Uh, but essentially, it is uh, hinging on the concept of uh, data that comes from other data, right? So things that you can derive with the data you already have. Um, so let's see how we can use the data model to prevent uh, garbage coming in. So no definitions. So imagine this is the output that we want to get, right? You want to know your total deposits that you have on file. Imagine you're a bank um, in US dollars, right? Which column do you use? What number do you put there as the application developer? You've accepted this garbage in. What do you put? You have no idea. It could be the USD amount. It could be the total balance. It could be the deposit balance. Who knows, right? This is terrible. You can't do anything with this data um, that's useful. So as a data model, as a governance point of view, you shouldn't accept any attribute into your system without a very clear, very well-defined definition. Right? I should be able to go look up what each of these mean, and they should all be consistent. Next, data without validations. Here, we have the currency column. What is all? Is that all currencies? Or is that an actual currency code? Right? We don't know. If this column had uh, a validation saying that this must be one of the ISO 4217 currencies, then we'd know that that's actually the Albanian lek, and that is a real currency. And it's not someone just putting all to identify like a sort of a catch-all term. Start date. We have three dates there. Two look like they're in the same format. But we don't know if that's year, month, day, or day, month, year, right? We don't know. So this is, again, terrible. The data is unusable. Um, but the worrying thing is you're probably using it already, right? Someone probably wrote a hack somewhere in some software to adapt to that and to just assume it's day, month, year, right? Which can cause all sorts of problems. So rule number two, accept no data attribute without limitation or validation. Even if it's basic, this number must between be between zero and infinity, you need some sort of validation in your system. So this is the same data, but I've removed all of the problematic uh, attributes, right? Everything that in my book wouldn't pass validation, right? So if you look back over there, we had a balance of zero, which doesn't make sense. No exchange rate is going to give you a zero. Um, so I've removed, removed these. So in my opinion, this data, obviously, is missing values, right? But it doesn't have wrong values. Everything here can be validated. Everything matches a format. Um, everything looks clear, right? Even the names, um, you think we can define those quite well. Right? So in my opinion, having no data is better than having bad data. Because um, at least it tells you something uh, useful, which is that I don't know what this data is. It could be this date. It could be that. But I don't know. Um, and this very much comes to the concept of uh, like when you make an omelet, right? Uh, you want to catch rotten eggs before you make the omelet, you serve it to the customer, and they complain, right? You want to catch the rotten eggs before anything is cooked. It's faster, it's cheaper, and there's a better customer experience. Um, next, we have uh, flags. Uh, so flags are our binary views of the world. Um, so here, imagine we have some sort of reporting output that says we want to get deposits from SMEs and deposits from governments. Yeah, two simple things. We go over to our data, and we have these flags. Oh, nice, someone has already done this uh, for me. Let me just use the flags, right? So as an application developer, you write a little program. You say, filter on this, filter on that, put the num number in there. You may not even look at the data itself, right? You may just look at the columns, a few things and you build your application, right? What you won't notice is that if you have two flags side by side like this, they can contradict each other. How can you be an SME and a government, right? Impossible. 
this is bad data, right? Why is it there? Because we allowed this concept of flags. Instead, you could do something like merge the two um, columns together, um, or maybe include this information in the category column, right? So that you have mutually exclusive fields um, and not um, this kind of contradicting information or the possibility for contradicting information. Because um, as we know, anything that can go wrong eventually will go wrong. Uh, so flags are not your friend. Uh, flags are really evil. Um, so the last thing I want to talk about are derived values. Um, and so this was a shortcut that many people took in the past um, to put derived aspects of data directly into the data itself. And this was done, uh, I think, originally for performance reasons, when CPU and memory and these kinds of things were very expensive and very difficult um, to, to use, because um, they weren't that available as they are today. People would calculate things and put the results back on the database to use them later. Um, this is no longer required. We have loads of compute power, loads of memory is cheaper, um, and database is actually slower now. Right? So you don't want, you want to have actually less data to do things. Um, so what do we have here? We have, again, we're looking for total deposits. We have a GBP amount, and we have a USD amount. Great. So you know, I live in London. I'll take the GBP amount. I'll multiply it times the exchange rate, 116 in euros. I'll put 116 euros there. Right? My friend who lives in the US, he says, oh, we're going to use this column because uh, it's easier for me, and I'll multiply times the exchange rate, and I'll put 120 there. We're getting two different results from exactly the same row of data. This is a huge problem. Right? And what's even worse about this than the flags issue is I can't actually tell which column is wrong. Is it the exchange rates? Is it the GBP amount? Is it the USD amount? So this means that not only is the output of your derived thing incorrect, but also all the inputs. So you have to basically toss everything out. Right? So this is the worst kind of thing to find um, in your data. Um, so this has been dry and very technical. I apologize. Um, but now we have four rules. Right? We have four rules that we can, we can abide by. Um, and we should be able to create a nice, a nice data model out of this. Um, this is nice, like I'm in the presentation. Um, so yeah, so the, I guess the defining thing here is adhere to principles, right? You don't want your data to be governed by the person who screams the loudest or who pretends to have the most expertise um, or who is in charge of the application or who is in charge of the database because um, that person is probably going to be gone in a few years, right? And the decisions they took are going to live on in your data model and in your data forever, right? Data rarely gets deleted, especially in large banks and insurance companies. Um, data never disappears. It gets transferred from one system to the other, and you end up with data tables with hundreds of columns where people are only using 20, but they don't know what the other ones mean, but they have to keep it around because someone somewhere could be using them. So adhere to principles, not your boss, right? So definitions, validations, no flags, and no derived values, right? If you can stick to this, I guarantee you can have good quality data coming into your system. It may mean you have to face the fact that you have bad data, but you'll face it earlier on because you won't accept that data into your application. So um, with FHIR, um, these are our three guiding principles. And so they roughly cover these topics. Um, data attributes should always be true. So ours is a financial regulatory data model. And hence, every single column, every single attribute that we have must be backed up by a paragraph of legislation. So that little part where they say, you know, quotes, this means this in this context, etc. that's what we copy in and put as our definition for that attribute. And then it becomes sort of legally defined. Um, and this also the validation comes with that, right? Date formats have to be in ISO standards. Currencies are in ISO standards. All of those things, um, it's just good sense. Um, finally, data attributes should be atomic. Um, this is, again, the concept of uh, derivable properties. Right? You don't want uh, logic embedded in the database. So everything should be its own thing. And you shouldn't be able to figure out something from something else. Um, that not only helps for data quality, but also means you have less data, which means less problems, uh, more efficiency. Um, everything is better. 
Um, con consistency is, again, about the flags issue. If you have flags, you will always run into issues. You will find uh, them contradicting each other. You will find you're required to expand them to include other things, the shades of gray. Um, so yeah, so these are our three guiding principles. This works. So this is not just a theoretical talk. It's not a vision. We've been doing this um, for the past four years. Um, there's over 500 uh, firms around the world subscribe to this model. Um, and, and it's working. It's working in practice. It's working at scale. Um, and it's open source. So if you want to contribute, if you want to get involved, um, you can go to our, our website, um, suede.org slash fire. We'll accept contributions um, as long as you follow those principles. Um, so I've left some time at the end for questions. Um, but given the lack of engagement earlier, um, <laughs> we do we have, have any, any hands up if you've got any questions? Nobody, really? Nobody deals with data? Wow. Okay. Well, with that, let's give a huge round of applause. Thank you. Thank you so much.